So it will no longer, it will not sell for $1 million. Chances are, if the market cap rate is 10%, then the new sale price would be $2 million. That's what I'm saying, the cap rate doesn't change. No, the cap rate for, okay, you're talking about two different things. You're looking at it differently. The, the return. Your return while you own it. Yeah, the return, I understand. What I'm saying is like if the market says the cap rate for class A building is 6%, right. the, the, the cap rate for class A building is 6%. Like, I mean, your return could fluctuate, but. Yes, but okay. What could happen is you could go from, you know, class A to A plus or class A to A minus, and there could be a difference in the, in the cap rate from one of those you know, minor shifts, if you will, within the market in some way. So yes, the cap rate could change and the value could change, but in this particular instance, clearly, whenever you were only getting $100,000 in revenue, assuming you did not have to put any additional money into it, and then you all of a sudden are getting 200,000, that is due to, a, it has to be due to only just a couple different things. One is you have an astronomical increase in market-based rents, or you had a tenant in the property that their lease expired after an, ex an extended period of time that was not at market. You know, so there, there's, a, there's only a handful of explanations that would allow you to go from this to this without any adjustment here? Let's see, Steve. Okay, oh, I'm sorry. Steve has something to say. Oh, sorry. No, you, you pretty much explained it. I mean, I guess everybody's getting confused between the going in cap and the sale cap. Yep. I mean, if, if you don't change the, the use or the, you know, you want class A or class A plus, so just say you spend some money in a class A product and you increase your income, the market cap rate and sales not going to change. Right. I think they were just confusing the market, the sale cap rate with your going in cap rate. So those are two different. Rates. Yeah, and, 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 and over time, you know, the cap rate for a property type can change. You know, you buy a property in 2005, and now you know you're selling it in, in 2016, and you know over that 11 year you know time period, there's going to be probably a difference between the cap rate then and the cap rate now. Right. It's a value of. Yeah, yeah. Or when, or, or when now, you know, depending on the circumstances. Oh. All right. Doesn't make money. Quincy's all about cash flow. Quincy is the cash flow king. Okay. So, all right. Let me make sure that um, back where we need to be here. Okay. So getting back to this whole you know, renovation thing. So what we would be doing, that I was, was about to, to embark on, was to say, all right, to make that kind of renovation decision, if we were going back to our kind of original analysis, what we would be changing would be basically how much money we're, additional money we're having to put in for the renovation, <laughs> and then what is that marginal extra amount that we'd be generating in operating income, okay, on an after tax basis. So in this case, um, let's just say that, and once again, I'm kind of mixing and matching here um, in terms of before tax and after tax, but just to kind of try to keep things simple. So we had 120, let me do it up here on the board so I can easier. Okay, so originally, oops, for year five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. Here, originally, we had 125,000, and we had 30,000 for each of these years. And we said that, would give us an IRR of 26.37, okay? That was kind of our original sort of scenario. Now, what if we sort of look at this, okay, now we're trying to analyze it from the renovation sort of perspective. And from the renovation perspective, we've got to put in maybe 
an extra 200 grand. So that means that now our total cash involved is let's say 325,000. So plus 200,000, okay? Bear with me on that. And with that extra $200,000, we're gonna generate, let's say an extra 20 grand per year in after-tax revenue. So that means that now all of a sudden this is gonna be 50 grand. Final cash flow of 50 grand plus. Now, the question is so we originally were going to be able to cash out $150,000 on an after tax basis. Now, with an additional $200,000, you would hope that we're going to be able to reclaim all of that and maybe a little bit more. But let's just say that we end up with, I don't know, $375,000 on an after tax basis. Okay? So, Let's do this analysis and then see what our rate of return will be. And then we'll talk about the decision rules. slumlord mentality. You know, we're, we're basically just milking the property for every dollar we can and trying to maximize our return. But also, there's another reason why we shouldn't do this. That's below our 20% alternative investment that, that we would have been better off selling the property, cashing out, you know, up front, and then going with our alternative than to go with this. Okay? So, you know, the, you know, Really, our best alternative is, is you know, to probably you know, stick with just owning the property. Our second best alternative would be selling the property, taking our 20% you know, kind of, of other alternative investment. Our third choice would be to go with this, okay? Unless we get something called a historic tax credit. Renovating historic structures. That's what forty percent. Well, not not forty percent. It's, it's it depends on the the, uh, the number the year it was placed in the service. So <coughs> there's no erasers here. All right. <laughs> I like the way you're thinking. Right? <laughs> so actually, I can go back up to the board for this one. Um, okay. So one of the things. Use this on the iPad, that would be great. <laughs> You're somewhere. Roll off the table. No, it's right there. Oh, it's by the computer. Your right. Oh. Right. It's just hiding. Yes. Okay. So, historic tax credits. <laughs> So basically, if you have a structure that was placed into service before 1936, you get a 10% income tax credit. Before 1936, and you're saying, what is the significance of 1936? The law was passed in 1986, and they basically were saying anything older than 50 years at that point in time is considered to be historic. Okay, so it's kind of stayed fixed in, fixed in time at 1936. 
or if you have a property that has been designated designated historic property and typically what this means is it's one of those properties that is in a historic district or it has been actually you know designated by the national um, historic registry or whatever the, the actual term for it is um, and if that's the case you can do it. it doesn't have to be by them like you could have a you and then you, as an owner, exactly can apply. Yeah. To, to no, no, you can. No, you can. You can. I mean, it's easier if it's part of a district because oh, it's like, yeah, yeah. if it's part of a district, it automatically qualifies. But if it is, you know, just your own individual property, then you've got to go through the application well, process. You might not get it. But right. But but if it's already part of a district, and, and usually this is once again, this is where most of the time this is going to apply to residential structures to homes. Um, but you know, in a lot of cities where you've got commercial buildings that were built prior to 1936, you know, old, like we're saying, old hotels, you know, but even warehouses would qualify if they're, you know, once again, in a, you know, a district or older than, you know, 1936, or office buildings, that sort of thing. Now, what is the difference, though, between a tax credit and a tax deduction? Because if you remember, this, this is very different and how this applies, that if we go back just for a moment and you know, we do our normal little cap tax calculation where we said take net operating income, we subtract out interest expense, and we subtract out depreciation, we subtract out amortization of points, etc., and that gives us taxable income. And then we multiply that by our marginal tax rate and that gives us our taxes payable. Where does tax credit insert? Right here. Because a tax credit is a dollar for dollar reduction in Well, actually, no, it's actually income tax is payable, my bad. My brain is thinking one thing and my hand is writing another. Okay. There's a dollar for dollar reduction in income taxes payable. Okay. In the sense that if you had taxes payable of $100,000, and you had a project that was a historic project, it was a million dollar project, and your renovation cost, you know, on that project were, let's say, 500000 then if it was a certified historic structure, then 20% of that, or 100000 would be the value of tax credit, meaning that you would wipe out that $100,000 tax liability for that particular property. That's simplifying it, but you get the general idea. Yep? Let me ask you, typically don't you, you know, because to finance these projects, you don't really, maybe you don't have the 400000 so typically don't you take that tax credit and you sell it to yes. somebody else? Yes, I was about to get to that. Okay. okay, yep. So the tax credit is based on the renovation expense? Yes. Because it's, it's, the, it's, it's basically it's saying, okay, you bought the property for what have you bought it for, okay? But we're giving you an incentive to renovate the property. Not just to own the property, but to renovate the property. So for every dollar that you spend on the renovation, we will give you a 20% tax credit, which will reduce your income taxes payable, okay? So it's not just a deduction from your NOI that would affect your taxable income, it actually affects your actual after-tax taxes payable. Is that only the first year? Pretty much, I mean, it's, because it's, it's, it's think about it, it's a sunk cost. Your renovation costs are sort of a sunk cost. Now, 
one of the things that's extremely important to point out with this is what you brought up, and that is that these tax credits are transferable, or you can sell them off into the, to the market. And the perfect situation is whenever you're maybe a nonprofit developer, so you get no real, I mean, think about it. If you're a nonprofit, like a church, you don't pay taxes. So let's say that you buy a church, an old church, you renovate the church as a church, it's a nonprofit, and you know it's a really old church, and so, and, and it's in a historic district, so you're gonna get that 20%, you know, um, tax credit that would reduce your tax payable. Well, you're not gonna have any taxes because you're a tax, you're a tax-free entity, you're a nonprofit. So what you can do is you can sell those tax credits to some high net worth individual or corporation, and then they can use those tax credits to offset some of their tax liability. And so the, the, the value, if you will, of the tax credit is let's say $100,000, but you might be able to sell it to some high net worth individual for maybe 90% you know, of that or 80% of that, you know, whatever the, the going rate is, but it's enough that they're going to be able to reduce, you know, on some marginal level, their their taxable income. Are there any regulations on doing that? Yes. Oh, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's very, very cumbersome. You know, tax code complication. But conceptually, you know, in a perfect world, you know, it, it should be all once again friction free, but it's not. You know, the, the the problem that you face with this process, and the reason why in many cases it doesn't get done, is because whenever you start applying for this tax credit, you've got to go through a whole sort of review process and inspection process and certification process with the federal and the state government to basically qualify for all this and, and all the paperwork involved that normally it doesn't make sense to do this on a small project. It's usually whenever you're taking on some excuse me, massive you know, wholesale renovation. Like one of the ones I saw it used on in Texas was a renovation of the Rice Hotel in downtown Houston that you know, old 1920s, you know, sort of uh, just amazing, you know, hotel. And the hotel had sat basically vacant for a number of years. And the developer was able to come in and turn it into loft apartments. And what what he ended up doing was he took advantage of this, but it, but it was, it was, you know, one of those things that he would talk about just how painful, you know, it was on this multi, multi-million dollar project, but it, at the same time, you know, it did allow for, you know, some extra features to be built into the property that would have would not have been there otherwise because you got that extra little sort of benefit of the, the, the tax benefit. So on a uh, affordable housing development, I mean, it's a similar concept, where instead of the renovation cost, it'd be an extra construction cost and you credit on that? Yeah, and then those sort of tax credits are totally different. I mean, totally different in the sense that they, they um, you can get low income housing tax credits and they, you can buy and sell those as well. What are the rates on that? What's that, like 5%, something like that? I mean, I'm not, well, those are I'm not, not, I'm not overly, I mean, that one I'm not as familiar with because I've never used a local housing tax credit. Okay, but you get the general idea. But so my, my point that I was trying to, to, to illustrate with this was, like in this particular scenario, if we were able to cash in on some of those historic tax credits, we could potentially beef up our overall rate of return where this could be substantially higher than 17.55 because we're getting those tax credits. Does that make sense? Okay, any questions on any of that? Yep. Can you have a negative tax yep. Is payable? Yep. Because what, what happens with negative taxes payable is a carryover loss to the next taxable year. And so the, let's say your project doesn't make any money at all this year, it loses money this first year. What you then get to do is take carry that forward to the next year and that dollar amount that you basically were negative in the first year, you apply it to the second year's taxable income and potentially reduce it down. And you can have that negative carry forward for several years you know, till ultimately you get to a point of where it's profitable. But usually it's like a year or two that you, you know, maybe have. I mean, thinking about it from a normal operations, operational perspective, you know, during the first year of operation in a property, 
you may have negative cash flow, especially on a, from a tax perspective, because you've got lease up that you're trying to, to, to deal with on the property. Maybe you know you, um, and and as a result, the property may not be fully occupied during that first year. So it's perfectly natural for it to have that negative income and negative tax liability that would carry forward in the following year. Now, one of the things that is a good San Miguel sort of question is to get into the difference between active versus passive losses associated with real estate. In 1986, we had a, a tax law change, and granted it was you know, 30 years ago, but that tax law change changed everything. I mean, in the sense of previous to that, you could pretty much have almost unlimited passive losses on real estate. And by that, what I mean is, let's say that you're a high net worth individual, that you're maybe a you know, medical doctor, attorney, whatever, and you've got a lot of extra disposable income, and then you decide to invest it into real estate, okay? And that real estate doesn't inherently make money, okay, in, in this particular you know, market. It, you're just basically buying the, 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 the real estate in order to own the real estate, and the, the real estate may be even unoccupied and it's generating negative, 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 negative tax losses each and every year. What are you doing? You're taking and you're applying those losses to offset your other income as a medical doctor or attorney or whatever. It becomes a tax shelter for your income. Well, what happened in 1986, they basically said, yeah, we're gonna get rid of, uh, or we're gonna limit these sort of passive losses and so they, they sort of, you know, they create all these new rules that effectively said you've got to be an active manager, participant in the oversight and the, the leasing and the management of these assets in order to be able to claim these losses from those assets against other income that you have, okay? Um, you know, and once again, the devil is in the detail of, of all of those, but, but suffice it to say, that that had a very negative impact from a tax policy perspective on real estate investment for a number of years because all these folks that had been investing in it for all the wrong reasons, they were investing it purely for tax benefits, right. not for the market dynamics of how the assets were actually performing. Because what was, was happening, and especially in Texas was just it was like a like literally ground zero for, for a lot of this. It was, you know, people were like basically building strip centers and condos, you know, just, just, to lose money. just to lose money. I mean, and it was just like, you, you were driving the road and you would just see empty strip center after empty strip center after empty strip center after, you know, and it was just basically all these sort of single owner properties that were just really just there to lose money. Now, as far as you get compared over the natives of next year, would that be considered deferred taxes? Like, I mean, they're just supposed to be taxes each year? Well, I mean, it's not necessarily. I mean, you, well, you have no taxes to pay, so it's not you're, you're not deferring your taxes. You're deferring. Um, you're carrying over your. You're carrying over your loss. So at the end of the year, where you lost money, like what do you do when you file taxes? Pay zero. You, you pay zero. Pay zero. But you still have like a deficit. You still have like a, a loss. So you're going to carry over next year. Like the government not pay you. Like I mean, the government's <laughs> not going to pay you for your loss. Okay, that's not the way it works. Oh, it's all for losing money, man. No. You know, they're, they're not going to make you whole. No, that's not the way that it works. No. The, the, the following year, you would get subtracted. If, if you had a, you know, some income in the following year, you would get subtracted from that. But my whole point with what I was, was discussing was if you had other sources of income, like, for example, let's say that you own other properties other than the one that lost money, then potentially depending on the ownership structure and, you know, that you could use those other properties and offset the income, you know, from those other properties with the losses on, on this property. But see, that's also where it gets very tricky is, you know, let's say that you guys, you know, you, you, you own several different properties, but maybe, you know, a couple of them you own only in your name, and then you, granted okay, you're married, so it's maybe complicates even further, but, but, but the point being is, you know, in order to, 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 to get those sort of benefits from the income off of the other properties to, in terms of the tax losses, um, 
they would probably pretty much going to have to be in the same ownership structure. Otherwise, it's going to get incredibly complex to be able to kind of cross over, if you will, between them to, to sort of um, take advantage of that. Can you retrofit taxes? Can you what? Retrofit, like go back in the past and start carrying over what you lost? To a certain extent, yes. I mean, in terms of, you know, can you, uh, but there, there's a limitation, and I'm trying to remember, I think it was like seven years or something like that seems to be the, the number that sticks in my head of, of how many years that that you can carry forward tax losses. Or maybe it's fine. Well, somewhere in that vicinity. Hopefully you don't have to ever carry them forward that long a period of time. Normally, it's going to be just a year or two that you're going to have, have that sort of situation. Now, see, the other way that you could also have a tax loss would be what if you do a significant little renovation during the, the time period of your ownership? And you've expended a lot of cash, you know, during that, that period of time, especially if you have those classified as repair and maintenance expenses, then that could very well cause you to have a tax debt. Well, in other, words, in other words, you have you have no income. You have negative basically tax liability and that would potentially then carry forward to the following year. Okay. All right. All right. Any other questions? Let's see here. We still have a handful of other topics that we will get into um, in the next class session. Next so next week we'll have a, um, a little bit of lecture and then the um, the last part of the class will be the little quiz over the chapter 14 material. 9-11? No, we're not 11. No, quiz for 11. Quiz for 11 was, was over, uh, um, that was last week, wasn't it? Yeah. Last, yeah, last week was test one. Oh, it was the test. Yeah, and then the previous week was quiz three, chapter 11. Okay. Taxation. Next week, we have the quiz for this material, chapter 14, um, in addition to the remainder of the lecture on 14. Yep. Will the next quiz include the spreadsheet in the last class? No. The spreadsheet, that's what we're going to be using the spreadsheet for are the case studies. Okay. So what, what's going to happen with the, with, the, with, the, with the case studies in the spreadsheet is you're going to have a couple of case studies that you're going to do in class using the spreadsheet to help you with them. That's basically what it's boiling down to. Okay. All right. Well, it's just the problems that we've gone over in class, just like all of us. Okay. Anything else? Okay, now. Let's see. Uh, missing anything that we need to just real quickly go over. Before I miss anything else. Thank Okay, one final quiz topic and then we'll be done. sale contract. I know that San Miguel has talked about it a little bit in, in the, the taxation class, but what is it? I mean, you, you agree to purchase a property at some price and it will be paid at certain intervals. Is it like a, con is it like a contract for me? It is. Okay. Also, you can You can also kind of sort of think about it as almost like lease to own. You know, I mean, but it, you know, it's a little bit different. Now, why would you, as an investor, engage in an installment sale contract for tax purposes? Would be one reason. Okay, because let's say that, that you know I own a property, and I'm saying to myself, I can either sell this property outright right now, take a capital gain and um, pay tax on that capital gain right this minute, or I can potentially 
sell this property, let's say, to you, and work out an arrangement where over the next 15 years, you make payments to me, sort of seller financing. And over that 15 year period, you're gonna make payments to me each and every month for the property. Well, what I can do is if I engage in that sort of, a, of an arrangement, I can effectively amortize or allocate my gain over the entire 15 years. So that I, instead of taking one big lump sum, I can you know, potentially get the benefit of the income over the next 15 years and sort of look at it almost like as an annuity, okay? But I can also structure it in a way of where maybe you make relatively small payments to me now while I'm still generating a bunch of income and other things, but maybe I'm gonna retire in five or 10 years and I may say, okay, whenever I retire, then I wanna escalate those payments up dramatically because they're I'm not going to have as much maybe normal income, and I want to kind of defer my income, you know, a little bit further out. So that's another possibility. But, you know, the, the whole thing, you know, also with the installment sale contract or the seller financing, you know, or contract for deed, whatever we want to call it, is the chances are I'm not giving this to you interest-free. That, in other words, I'm still going to be charging you some sort of, a, of, a, of an interest payment on this loan. Okay, it's because the fact is what it is. I'm loaning you the money to buy my property that I own free and clear. And so I'm going to get the extra benefit of being able to sort of say, all right, you know, because this goes back to that whole alternative investment thing. If I were to sell it outright right now, all I'm going to do is walk away with my capital gain, have to pay taxes on it, that sort of thing. What do I do with the money? Do I just stuff it in the mattress? Do I put it in some sort of alternative investment? What do I do with it? Well, but if I, can, if I can charge you a substantial enough interest rate on that, then that precludes me from having to look for an alternative investment because I'm going to get basically an additional rate of return off of you, off of that interest. Let me ask you a question. By doing that, you, you don't have to go, you don't get taxed capital gain, you just will get taxed over. You, you, get, you get taxed your, your income. Your, your, okay, you're going, to have, you're going to have two forms of taxation over that 15 period, 15 yeah. year period. You're going to have ordinary income tax off of the interest expense, yeah. and you're going to have the proportional capital gain off of the principal that is paid over that time period. So you're always going to have that. You're always going to have the capital gain, I mean, unless we do the 1031 tax deferred exchange, yeah. which we'll, we'll talk about as well a little bit more. Okay, But the, the, the point being is, if you think about this, just kind of for simplicity's sake, we've got this property for $500,000 and we're saying, okay, 12 payments per year, and we're gonna charge you 5% interest over 15 years. That means your monthly payment, to keep things simple here, is 39.53, 96, and now if you think about this just for a moment, by virtue of that 5% interest, we multiply that out by the, the five years or 180 months of payments. That means my total cash inflow off of this sale would be $711,714, which obviously that's including the, the interest portion of this, but so my, my point is, I'm able to potentially garner that much more for my property than I maybe would have been able to do so before. Another component of this that is interesting to, to, to think about is if I'm doing this sort of contract for deed, seller financing, installment sale contract, there's another aspect to it that you know, we're sort of leaving out. We talked about friction earlier of you know, potentially you know, having to go through all the brain damage of going through a sale or for financing. If I do seller financing directly with you, what do you technically get to avoid? You get to avoid a whole number of, of traditional financing costs. 
you're not going to have to, you don't have to get, I'm not saying you shouldn't get, but you don't have to get an appraisal. You don't have to get an inspection. You don't have to pay any sort of loan origination fees with a lender. You don't have to, to go through all of that sort of traditional sort of closing cost and the brain damage associated with that. You're able to work directly with me as effectively the de facto lender and ultimately we just engage in this 15 year mortgage contract yeah. of sorts. And what it also potentially allows me to do is to even set the price point that you know the actual value of the property might be four hundred thousand, but because we're I'm alleviating all this brain damage for you, we're going to make it five hundred grand. And then you own the deed. And then I don't actually transfer the deed until the final payment has been made at the end of fifteen years. Now, all of that having been said, every jurisdiction state jurisdiction is going to be a little bit different as to how they what they allow for in terms of like foreclosure with regard to a contract for deed in terms of how restricted they are historically if we engage in this kind of a relationship if you miss one payment i can pretty much say all deals are off, all deals are off. i take repossession of the property you're out of there and you know very little legal you know issues okay within the past eh, 10 15 or so years you know governments have tried to deal with with some of this to try to be more consumer friendly as it were and to, to make it a little bit more restrictive as to the the ease to which i as the the the, the seller of the property can initiate foreclosure proceedings on you and there is a little bit more of a due diligence process that maybe has to be followed. But on the surface, you know, it's a great way in many instances for you to be able to jump into owning a property or at least getting toward ownership of a property. Because it, I may also waive, as the, as the seller of this property, I may waive any sort of down payment requirement. I may just say, just start making payments to me, you know, over the next, and, and what this works really well on are properties that maybe have been occupied by a tenant for maybe a number of years like a retail tenant so if you own a little retail strip center and you've got a tenant that's been really good about paying their rent and there's maybe four or five other tenants in the, in the shopping center you say to them hey let's work on this arrangement you start collecting the rents for the other four or five tenants and as long as you make your mortgage payment to me i'm going to leave you alone and you manage the property and at the end of 15 years you own it great deal okay um, and, and you know another way that this gets used is like obviously within families that you have you know someone that you know, maybe owns a house and they're saying to their grandkids or their kids or whatever you know we'll work out some sort of a deal like this and you know instead of just giving it to them they work out you know some sort of a of an arrangement like this to where that there is a um, um, this kind of long term acquisition process. So in this scenario, I mean let's just say. The original value of the property is four hundred thousand. Sold at five hundred. So capital gain one hundred thousand. Well, no, no. I said the current market value may have been four hundred thousand, and we're we're selling it for five hundred thousand. And that's I'm not saying what my acquisition basis was. Oh, my okay. my my acquisition basis could have been a hundred thousand. What I'm saying is, if I purchased it four hundred, okay, there'd be a hundred thousand dollars in capital gain. That is correct. Regardless of the fact, you still have to pay the tax on the capital gain when you spread it out. Or that is correct. Okay, so in this scenario. It benefits the seller to do so if they don't have an alternate investment. They can just go ahead and do seller financing, but pay interest on the two hundred eleven thousand. I mean, tax on the two hundred eleven thousand dollar interest. So really, that interest would, or the interest income would offset the capital gains. That's kind of one reason to do it. Okay. Absolutely. Plus, as I said, you may be able to get more for the property up front than you ordinarily would, which would be another benefit, you know, from the standpoint of. of you know, even though you're maybe paying a little bit more overall in capital gains, it's worth it. Okay, all right, it's pretty much time for me to quit because I'm going to have to work to get started. So, thank you very much. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Dr. Foley, does this have any login restrictions? Nope.
Oh, I'm sorry? Yeah, key, but, uh, I don't even have an answer key to it. I don't know. It may. What was it? Yeah, that's a fun plan.